loin of this, leg of that. I am not eating the flesh of the animals. In America, if it has fur, we either eat it or wear it. As my daughter always says, there's a lot America could teach people in other countries, if they'd only wake up and listen. She says one day you'll be able to go into a restaurant in Istanbul and order a hamburger. What do you think of that? Why would you want to do such a thing? Why? Everybody wants a taste of home. I expect the Turks would agree with you. Exactly. That's what my daughter says. It's only a matter of time and Turks will love hamburgers. You will be sufficiently amiable to place in my compartment a bottle of mineral water before I retire this evening. Certainly, Your Excellency. For dinner, I shall have chicken cooked without sauces. Also, some boiled fish. I am very sorry, Your Excellency. There is no chicken or fish on the menu. Oh. Is he chef for this journey? The German? Oui, Your Highness. The cooking of Monsieur Klaus is admired all over Europe. It is a good that the train has secured his services. No doubt. Very well, I will have lamb. Again, without sauces. You've got to put it over big, whatever yourself. Sure, that is what I say all the time. With motor cars, it is no have measures. This steak is excellent. The pork is also very nice. Say, we haven't been introduced. That is very true. We haven't. You are not eating. I haven't much appetite this evening. How could I be so lucky to have found you? You found me? <laughs> Only after I'd chased you across three continents. The statues in the baggage car? Yes. I saw them loading the crate myself. They were very careful. Huh. They better be. If it's damaged, I might enjoy owning a railroad. Who knows? You travel often by train in your profession, mademoiselle? Yes, I do. You are a person most fortunate. I'd rather fly. Ah, oh, mais non. Not for me are the aeroplanes, with their sudden changes of altitude and the capricious tossing about of the passengers by the weather très mauvais. Non. In business, speed is often more important than comfort. No, it is more than the comfort. The trains, they lend themselves to the romance and the intrigue. All about us are people of all classes, of all nationalities, of all ages. They sleep and eat under one roof. They cannot get away from one another. And at the end of the three days, they part. They go their several ways, never perhaps to see each other again. For a few moments only, the skilled detective has the chance to study his fellow travelers, to watch their little stories unfold beneath the microscope of the trained eye. Tell me what you see. You as well, mademoiselle. We will make the little game of it, n'est-ce pas? One must look, one must listen at all times. If you were to listen at the door of any compartment, who knows what you may learn? That would not be very proper, Monsieur Poirot. Proper? The student of crime must also be the student of human nature. Oh, what better way to make the study, huh? I will illustrate. Mademoiselle Marceau, you are facing the entire car. Whereas Poirot, he sits with his back to most, and has only observed upon entering. Start with the table farthest away, the three ladies. Tell me about them. One is a Swedish missionary from a school near Gemlik on the Bosporus. She is also very uncomfortable in unfamiliar surroundings and gets lost easily. That is truly wonderful. How did you arrive at this? I helped her find the train inside the train station. Well, it is an important lesson that. When you know the facts, why bother with the clues? The younger woman is British from her accent. She seems very capable and down to earth. If we'd been at school together, I believe we would have been friends. Wait, oui. she has a strong character, that one. Perhaps the strongest among us. But she is a mystery number. Why do you say that? You observed her embrace of the most passionate kind with a proper English gentleman this afternoon? Yes, I did. Very un-English of both of them. As you say. And yet now she sits at another table, indifferent to him and his glances. Lovers quarrel? 
What can have happened in so short a time for the lovebirds to fly from the light into the darkness? The older woman with the loud voice is American. Even with the length of the car between us, one can tell that. Well, it is true what you say. And yet, she seems to be a woman quite amiable and without malice. A good beginning. And what is there to say about the tanned British gentleman? He has spent much time in the tropics. Wait, some far-flung corner of the British Empire. India, perhaps. Military, I would say, from the way he carries himself. Very good. He's not as proper as he looks. For he is so in love, it breaks down all the inhibitions. They are married, but not to one another. What did she say to him? Huh? Not now. Not now. When it is behind us, then. They are waiting for the divorce to be final. Mm, perhaps. Tan, military, a posting in Egypt, perhaps, or India. And now the grand lady who sits alone. I'd say royalty, a princess. Russian, probably. Oh, no, 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 no. You will not play the same trick on Poirot twice. Hello, she too, you have met? I did a small service for her earlier today. She has the very grim exterior, that one, but there is something about her, huh? A twinkle in the eye, perhaps? No, no. I think she is not quite so much the dragon as she appears. Hello, and across from her sits. Hildegard Schmidt. Yes, I met her too. Quite unpleasant for a lady's maid. They're usually such mild creatures. Vraiment. She also has sent her plate back to the chef twice for adjustments. Very particular about the cuisine. It would be nice if the menu was more varied. We march! This large table nearest the kitchen now, with the three gentlemen. What can you see? The Italian sells motor cars. He's very enthusiastic about cars in general. Wait. Oui. A salesman to his very soul, I would say. The American appears to be a commercial traveler of some sort. Wait, well, he carried the sample case when he boarded the train. Yet, I wonder. The case, it was quite small. But yet he seems very fit, does he not? The suit of such questionable taste, he can barely contain the muscles. Can't a commercial traveler be athletic? C'est possible. The Englishman is very quiet. He certainly does not share the enthusiasm for conversation of his companions. A superior sort, with a disapproving expression. Would that suggest nothing to you? I'm afraid not. A gentleman's gentleman, as the British would say. A valet. Yes, I can see him pressing trousers and shining shoes. And now, as discreetly as possible, observe the young couple directly behind me. Her dress is exquisite, very expensive, and the jewels. Ah, oh, she's lovely, the kind of woman a man would marry and lavish gifts upon. It is very romantic, is it not? And yet I detect the melancholy in your voice, mademoiselle. I'm sorry, I expect it's jealousy. I grew up in Jukar, a small town near Avignon. My parents wanted me to stay in Jukar and marry well, but I rebelled. Ah. Have you never rebelled, Monsieur Poirot? These days, not so much, I fear. Rebellion, it is for the young. I went to England, too, to university, then out here to Istanbul. I wanted to get as far away from Jukar as I could. I wanted mystery, adventure, romance. I became a clerk. No mystery, no adventure, and certainly no time for romance. Poirot is not so much the expert on romance. Yet mystery and adventure may be closer than you think. The man is very handsome, aristocratic. He dresses as an Englishman, but his accent is Hungarian, I think. Oui, a diplomat, I believe. Fiercely in love. Fiercely? The man who makes the unwanted advances to his young wife would suffer for it. And now, to the last table, where the older gentleman has been glancing this way throughout dinner. 
The older man's name is Ratchet, an American. Very coarse and brutish, despite the fine clothes and table manners. He forced his attentions on me in the bazaar today. I think he's been trying to renew the attempt all through dinner. He keeps looking this way. Most would see the smiling round face with the pink cheeks and the brilliantly white teeth that are false and say, there sits a benevolent personality indeed. There is no smile in his eyes. No, there is a dark fever in them. Not a benevolent man, not a nice man at all. And forgive me, mademoiselle, but I do not think that he has been watching you. Poirot is the unfortunate victim of his interest this evening. The younger American man is named Hector something. I like him. He seems very open and pleasant. He's Mr. Ratchet's secretary, I believe, but I don't think he's very happy in the position. Perhaps an acquaintance worth cultivating for an attractive young lady traveling alone? Monsieur Poirot, I would never be so forward. Oh, but it is 1934, mademoiselle. Young ladies are forward. Even those from Juca? Hector, I'm not having dessert. I thought I might try the... You go get started on those letters I dictated. But I... Yes, sir. I think I have the pleasure of speaking to Monsieur Hercule Poirot. You have been correctly informed, Monsieur. My name's Ratchet. In my country, we come to the point quickly. Mr. Poirot, I want you to take on a job for me. It means big money. Big money. I'm a rich man. Rich men have enemies. I have an enemy. Only one enemy? Just what do you mean by that? Monsieur, in my experience, when a man he is in a position to have, as you say, the enemies, then it does not usually resolve itself into one enemy alone. I appreciate your point. Enemy or enemies, it doesn't matter. What matters is my safety. My life has been threatened, Monsieur Poirot. I'm used to taking pretty good care of myself. I'm not the kind of man to be caught napping. But you'll be extra insurance. I regret, monsieur. I cannot oblige you. Name your price. I have been very fortunate in my profession, monsieur. I have made enough money to satisfy both my needs and my caprices. I take now only such cases as interest me. What's wrong with my proposition? If you will forgive me for being personal, I do not like your face, Monsieur Ratchet. Crane Company employee! I have checked the baggage car for the supplies I ordered to be delivered here in Belgrade. There is no bacon. I will not make a breakfast tomorrow without the bacon. My reputation is at stake. Find me my bacon or I leave the train here and you can cook all the meals yourself. Train company employee? I suppose it wouldn't hurt to look around. Belgrade. This will be a brief stop to take on supplies, mail, and to add the Athens-Paris coach. There will be few, if any, passengers in this weather. Quite interesting. Bloody awful weather. The train better get moving soon. The passes west of here fill with snow pretty fast. Back in 29, there was a train trapped up there for a week. 
Ah, Colonel Arbuthnot, isn't it? And Mr. McQueen. That's right. Say, you're the company representative, aren't you? I heard there was one on the train. Is there anyone in the station? Only people we've seen were an attendant and a passenger, I think. They boarded that coach they're adding to the train. Then somebody turned out the station lights. It's the Athens Paris coach, I think. Mr. Ratchet and I travel this route quite a bit. Yes, well, I have all the fresh air I need, if you'll excuse me. I'll be getting along then, too. Don't want to hold us up. The attendant I saw boarding the restaurant car came through this gate. I suppose that woman was seeing him off. This is our company representative from Istanbul? A woman? Mademoiselle Marceau, this is Tayyip, our engineer. What is the report from the station master? It is not good, I'm afraid. Heavy snow is forecast for the mountains. The passes between Vancouver and Broad will fill up quickly. Klaus is missing a side of bacon. He told me. I showed him the manifest. It was not on the Athens Paris car. How many passengers joined us here in Belgrade? Only one. A uh, Greek doctor, I believe. I think I saw the Athens Paris coach attendant board the restaurant car just now. Really? He should be back in the Athens Paris coach. Au revoir, monsieur. Are you ready to go? I have been ready. I am not the slow one here. It is the Serbs. Can we reach Broad in this weather? If any engine can get us through, it will be this 460. I suppose I'll have to take responsibility if we go on. Company representative? And a woman? No, this is my train, my decision. We go. It is frustrating not to know what it says. If only I spoke Serbian. Serbian, I suppose. It would have to be Serbian. Can you read Serbian? A little. The manifests from Belgrade are in Serbian. Could you read some tags on the Prague luggage truck for me? Yes, of course. That appears to be a box of golf balls. That is, I believe, the toilet paper, mademoiselle. From the looks of it, that crate contains more carrot juice than Prague will ever need. Slanina, we have found Klaus's bacon, Mademoiselle Marceau. Will you take it to him so we can get underway? At once. I do not protest the addition of you in my room, miss. You have helped me, and I am glad of the company, and I am a Christian lady whose heart is filled with charity. 
Fine, that's settled then. But I have already been picking out the lower bunk for me, because I am afraid of the heights and the sudden stops of trains, and I would not like to return to the children broken. The upper bunk will do fine for me. I'll look forward to the adventure. And now, miss, excuse me, please. I will go to the WC, as you call it. I was educated in England, but I'm French. Oh? I was educated in Sweden, and I'm Swedish. <laughs> you call it the toilet? Am I going to the toilet? Mademoiselle Olsen, how you spend the next few minutes of your life is entirely your own private affair. Yeah, it is. <laughs>